Thanks again. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for attending a second in our series on Gondwana and Snowball Earth. Uh, last session, we heard about Snowball Earth from Dr. Meert, and uh, I want to welcome our Zoom audience as well. So, uh, as I introduced Dr. Meert last week, I mentioned uh, that he is also the director of the Paleomagnetic Lab at UF Geological Sciences. Uh, with the laboratory and his team, he leads research into the origin, structure, and evolution of the Earth's magnetic field. His research uses the magnetic signature of iron-bearing minerals to identify a region's ancient geographic locations, and this this effort has taken him and his teams to remote areas of places like Kazakhstan, Siberia, India, and Africa. So please welcome Professor Meert. And now? Okay, so if we can start the show. Not me. It's not my stomach. I just had lunch. <laughs> so, go back. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this time I can move around because I have a I have a mic attached to me, so I can move around a little bit. Um, th this talk that I'm going to give today, I I'm actually. I actually really like this. Um, it's it's kind of breaking news in a way. This is something that we've been working on um, for the past six years. Our work continues, and as it continues, it seems to be more and more um, realistic. I mean, we, we're finding more and more evidence to support our initial conjectures. And I, I just want to introduce you to um, my colleagues. This is uh, Natasha Levashova. Misha Bajanov, who are um, Russian colleagues. Uh, Misha has passed away, unfortunately. A wonderful, wonderful man. They're both wonderful people, uh, wonderful colleagues. We're a little bit depressed about what's going on in the Ukraine because we, it, it affects our collaboration, but um, they are very much opposed to that. And then Ann Landing, who's at the um, New York State Museum, he's a paleontologist who specializes in the Ediacaran period, which is a time interval I'm gonna talk about, which follows immediately after the Snowball Earth episode. So the title of this is When Our Shield Goes Down, Life and the Importance of the Earth's Magnetic Field. And I must say, a lot of, a lot of people don't understand the importance of the magnetic field to life on Earth. Um, people know about compasses, they know about navigation, but without a magnetic field, we wouldn't be here. I wouldn't be here talking to you. There would be no life on this planet. This planet would be sterile. Um, and that's because the magnetic field provides a shield from in incoming radiation, from incoming bad radiation. So incoming solar radiation, incoming extragalactic radiation that has the effect of damaging tissues it also has the effect of wiping out our atmosphere. And so without our magnetic field, we, have, we don't have anything. So it's very, very important to us. So the time interval that I'm gonna talk about um, is the Ediacaran. And so back here, prior to this 635, that's when the last of those Snowball Earth episodes happened. And there was a, a non, uh, younger glaciation here, I mentioned this last time, called the Gaskiers. It wasn't global, it was more like the glaciations we had, you know, a couple million years ago. It covered high latitudes. And then following that glaciation, we started to see these strange organisms called the Ediacaran organisms, for whom this geological period is named after. And Ediacaran organisms, some of them were big, some of them were on the order of meter size, and some of them were quite small. And they were a fairly diverse community of organisms that we really don't have any idea what they are other than that they were alive. They had uh, communities and ecosystems, but we can't look at those organisms and say, 
oh yeah, that's an insect, or that one is a plant, or that one is um, a fish. We have no idea what these are. So they're very, very strange. And they lasted, they kind of had their heyday here at about 560 million years ago. But that was kind of their heyday. And then they went extinct at about 540 million years ago. And so it's interesting, um, it's interesting why this extinction happened. This is now being called the seventh mass extinction on Earth, okay? We know about a bunch of mass extinction. We know where the dinosaurs died. We know there were several mass extinctions that happened in relatively recent time. And then there's the current extinction that is happening today, which is the, the sixth extinction. And this has now been identified as the seventh great extinction of life on Earth. But this one is puzzling. Um, it's puzzling because we don't really know what they are, and we don't really, we don't fully understand why this happened, although there is a bunch of new data coming in that seems to support the hypothesis that I'm going to present to you today, and that is it's blame it on the magnetic field. All right. So this is the time period that we're going to look at today, and we're going to look at what happened to these Ediacaran biota and how it relates to what was going on with the Earth's magnetic field. Okay, so I mentioned this before. Without a magnetic field, we wouldn't be here. There would be no life, no atmosphere, no fun. Uh, Mars and Venus, our two closest neighbors, have no magnetic field to speak of. Mars is effectively a dead planet. There may have been life at one time when Mars had a magnetic field. It's gone. Its atmosphere is gone. The surface of the planet is sterile. And it's sterile because all of that incoming galactic and solar radiation uh, sterilizes the surface of the planet. Now, it may be, and that's what people are looking for, it may be that in the subsurface of Mars, there may still be some living organism. There may be refugia for some of these organisms to still live. That's obviously what some of the Mars missions are looking at today. So the key kind of idea to keep in mind is that our magnetic field is, is quite dynamic. The, the Earth's magnetic field is not just some static force field surrounding the Earth. It changes. It creates the northern lights. It creates the southern lights. It creates electrical disturbances and radio communication. And it grows in strength and it decreases in strength. And sometimes our compasses point north and sometimes our compasses point south. Today we're living in a time when all our compasses are pointing north. 780,000 years ago when the Neanderthals roamed the Earth, your compasses would have pointed to the south magnetic pole because the Earth's magnetic field flips. Just the magnetic field, not the entire planet, just the field. Um, so we can talk about some of the things that happen. This is the northern lights. So the sun will sometimes experience these solar storms it will send out energetic particles through space towards us. And what happens is that they hit our magnetic shield out here and they're deflected around the Earth. But because they're energetic and they have a polarity, they'll, they will be pulled into the south magnetic pole or pulled into the north magnetic pole where our field is the strongest. And they will react, those, those particles will react with the atmosphere, with oxygen and nitrogen. And they were formed these beautiful colors, these reds, these greens and purples that you see in the northern lights. So that's one of the visible effects of the Earth's magnetic field on our planet. There have been solar storms that are so strong and so violent on the sun that they actually have caused auroras that have been visible as far south as Florida. It's rare, but they have happened. They have also created ground currents, just like lightning, and they wiped out part of the Canadian electrical grid in 1989. For the most part, when solar storms happen here on Earth, most of what we experience, and we don't even get to experience because we're in Florida, but that's okay because we're warm, is the Northern Lights. That's the most outward visible expression of solar storms that we can see on Earth. For astronauts who are sitting in the space station when they have one of these solar storms, they actually have to move to another part of the space station that's specially shielded to get them out of the way of these energetic particles. 
because they, are, are, they, they cause damage to DNA. All right. So this is what, um, this is kind of a cartoon version, but it works really well as an explanation for the Earth's magnetic field. The Earth's magnetic field arises in the inner core of the Earth. The outer core is made of liquid, iron, and nickel, a little bit of sulfur. The inner core is solid, iron, nickel, and sulfur. Iron is a conductive metal. Iron is magnetic, you know that from life experience. And the fact that this outer core, this liquid outer core, is moving around the solid iron inner core, it actually generates a magnetic field. It behaves in much the same way, or the explanation is, is somewhat simple. In your car's alternator, your, a car will have a battery, of course, and when you start the car, what happens is there is a metal uh, kind of fan-like device that spins, and it spins inside a copper coil. And as it spins, that magnetic field in that steel plate generates an electric current in the coil, and that's sent out and charges your battery, turns on your lights. That's why when your alternator fails, everything goes dead. Okay? So this is very similar, although it's, it's liquid iron and solid iron rather than a um, it generates the Earth's magnetic field that has a north and south magnetic pole. Now, what's cool about our Earth, something we haven't witnessed, is that the Earth's magnetic field reverses polarity. So today, we call it a normal field, and all a normal field is, it's a north-seeking field. So the easiest way to think about this is that our compasses point towards the north magnetic pole. At times, this field flips the little magnet, and you can think of this as currents in the outer core, so the outer core changes its motion. And when that happens, then we get a reverse field, and then all of our compasses and the field strength is oriented towards the south magnetic pole. This happens in Earth history. It's happened many, many, many times. It is a random process. We cannot predict when the next one will happen and we can't predict how long it will stay in that polarity. It seems to be sometimes it will stay in a normal polarity for millions of years, sometimes it will stay in, in a normal polarity for only a few thousand years. So it's very hard to predict, but rocks record this, and that's what's cool. So we can look at the rock record, and we can figure out what this reversal pattern looks like, and this is what it looks like. So the black here are normal when the field is pointing north. The uh, white areas are reversed when the compass is pointing south. And then the gray are where we currently have no data. And you can see it's very, it's very random. And there are time intervals like here where it stays normal for many, many millions of years, 50 or 60 million years. There are time intervals where it stays reversed for many millions of years. And then there are intervals, for example, here in the Jurassic, um, where it's reversing very, very quickly. And what we have found out is looking back here into the Ediacaran, it's not shown on this graph, but when we look back in the Ediacaran, we are seeing the magnetic field reverse at a rate that's never been seen before. Three to seven times faster than anything we've seen since. And that has really important implications for life on Earth. So, how do we do this? Um, well, this is me in the field in India. This is my Indian colleague here. And we drill little rock samples using uh, basically a modified chainsaw with a diamond drill bit on it, water cooled. And we extract those cores and we keep them oriented and we take them back to the lab and we measure them in what's called a spinner magnetometer. Very, very simple machine. I don't know why it costs $80,000. It's a very simple machine. We put the sample in, we close the lid. Inside this lid is a series of copper coils, just like the alternator. And this is like that little steel thing in your car's alternator. And we spin the sample. And as we spin the sample, it generates, because it's magnetic, even though it's weakly magnetic, it generates electric current. And then we change position, it will generate a different, and from that electrical current and the strength of that electrical current, we can figure out the magnetic direction of the rock. Very, very easy. Very, very simple machine. Well, that gives us when, that gives us the polarity. We also need to know, if we're going to put it in a time frame, we have to know how old those rocks are. 
And we do that with another very simple machine invented in 1909 by a physicist named Ernst Rutherford. It's called a mass spectrometer. And what it does is it takes isotopes of uranium and lead. Uranium is radioactive, 235, 238. Those radioactive minerals decay to lead, 206 and 207. And because they have different weights, 235, 238, 207, 206, we can introduce them into this accelerometer and we pass it through a magnetic field and the lighter elements are pulled towards the magnetic field and the stronger elements as they pass through here, because they're heavier, they aren't as deflected as much. And then there's a little detector here and it just counts. One uranium, 207, two, three, and it just counts all those. And then the ratio of parent to daughter gives us the age. So we have the age and we have the polarity. Very, uh, very simple machines. Again, they cost a lot of money, but they're very simple in concept and in theory. All right, so what happens? What happened back then? Well, this is a kind of a scientific detective story that we stumbled upon because our work was actually aimed at, at determining where Northern Europe was back in the Ediacaran. We weren't really necessarily interested in how fast the Earth's magnetic field was reversing. But when we, we found this out, we realized that the Earth's magnetic field appeared to be reversing faster than any time we'd ever seen in history. So the key facts here, this is the key to this whole story that I'm gonna tell you, is that the strength of the magnetic field is inversely proportional to the rate of reversals. What does that mean? If it's not reversing, the magnetic field is very strong and very stable. Think of that, we have really good shields, okay? When it's rapidly reversing or hyperactive, very, very rapid, the magnetic field of the, of the Earth is weak and it's unstable. Our shields go down, all right? So there are a, a number of important effects associated with this overall weaker um, magnetic field. And the key one, um, there's two really, two key ones. The climatic effects, we can get increased cloudiness, but cloudiness can come and go. But the two big ones here are increased exposure to UVB radiation, which is why we wear sunscreen, and cosmic radiation, and ozone layer thinning. And so the combination of more UVB radiation, more cosmic radiation, and less of an atmosphere, of an ozone atmosphere to protect us from that, means higher rates of DNA damage. Unfortunately, it also drives off our atmosphere. So we lose oxygen in our upper atmosphere uh, via, via a process known as cold ion escape. Very similar to Mars. Mars had an atmosphere at one time when it's lost its magnetic field. All that radiation just stripped away the atmosphere of Mars. So it's a sterile planet. All right, so uh, I won't go through this a lot other than to say UVB radiation is the dangerous one. That's the one that we worry about on the surface of the earth. That's why we wear sunscreen. Um, it is modulated currently by the presence of the ozone layer and also by the magnetic field. But this one causes DNA damage. UVC is most harmful, but it never reaches the surface of the earth. So the only time you really have to worry about this is if you're, if you're flying fighter planes way up in the stratosphere, if you're in outer space, then UVC radiation becomes important. But for us, and for anything living on the surface of the Earth or in the shallow ocean, it's really that UVB radiation that we want to worry about. All right. There are some complex diagrams in this talk, and uh, I won't apologize for it. I'm just going to tell you it's there to show you that we're really doing science. But the, the point of these diagrams should be, again, relatively simple. And what I'm showing here is that we have demonstrated quite clearly that a weakened shield causes oxygen and ozone loss via some reactions in the upper atmosphere. And when the field is stable, so when we have a field like we have today, we have a shield out here that extends towards the sun about 10 Earth radii. So it's like stacking uh, the Earth out 10 times towards the sun, and that's where that shield is formed. When the, sh when the field is reversing, or when we lose the magnetic field, that protective layer is reduced to about two Earth radii. 
So we're losing our shields, a five-fold decrease in our shielding. And it turns out that back in the Ediacaran, because stars evolve and they get brighter and stronger um, through time and then they weaken again, it turns out that back in the Ediacaran, the pressure on the shield was 1.3 to one and a half times stronger than it is today. So imagine having a shield out there that's being pushed a little harder back then than it was today. And when you lose a shield coupled to that extra push, um, it means extra, extra problems for life on Earth. All right, um, this is a video, uh, and I think if you just click on it, so this is going to show you the sun is out here, and you're going to see the magnetic shielding out here, and we're going to see what happens when a solar storm hits that shield. And you'll see the shield will be compressed in towards the Earth, and then after the solar storm passes, it will build back out. So if you can just click on that video, it should work. Okay, here's our shield, the red here. The sun's out here and the storm will come and depress that shield. There's the storm. Okay, and then through time, the magnetic field will recover as the solar wind passes and the shield will, will build back out, okay? That happens all the time today, but it's a, it's a quite short-lived event. The problem occurs when we have these solar storms happening on a regular uh, interval and we have very little shielding out there. And that's, that's where the problem lies. So we can handle one or two of these a year, uh, no problem. We don't experience it other than bright northern lights. But if we have an overall weak field, we run into problems. Okay, so again, this is, this is complicated, but it's just to show you that there are a bunch of things that happen during Earth history, including these uh, solar proton events, galactic rays, all this radiation that, that comes into the Earth. And at these very strong, we can lose ozone. We can, our ozone can be depleted 50% at the equator and 80% at the poles. So we're losing our ozone layer as well, okay? Let's skip through this one. So here is what I call um, a series of fortunate or unfortunate events depending on whether if you're alive, if you go to extinction, obviously it's unfortunate. If you adapt and can get through this, obviously that's more fortunate. So what happens when we have a high reversal rate, when the Earth's magnetic field is flipping back and forth very, very rapidly, that leads to a, a, an overall low magnetic field strength. We lose our shield. That means higher incoming cosmic radiation it also means lower levels of ozone. It means higher incident UVB and other radiation, which results in higher rates of DNA damage and mutation. So if an organism or a population of organisms on Earth experiences this, there are really two things that can happen. One is they can become extinct. And this will be particularly pronounced in organisms that can't move. Sessile just means they can't move. So imagine that you're being hit by this radiation and you have no way to get away from it. Obviously, you're going to experience more damage. Your, your offspring, if you're still producing offspring uh, in their embryonic stage, are going to incur more DNA damage. You're, you're very likely to end up extinct. And it turns out in the Ediacaran, I think I mentioned this last time, but if I didn't, if you went to the Ediacaran oceans, if you went to the beach back in the Ediacaran, you would walk on this bacterial slime. Everywhere on Earth, the beaches were covered with this bacterial slime. It was really gross. And all life was confined either on that bacterial slime mat or within that bacterial slime um, mat. There was nothing beneath it. So it was a real thin layer where all life was existing at that time. On the other hand, if the population through selective mutation, beneficial mutation, was somehow able to avoid UVB or repair damage caused by UVB, then you would more likely survive. And that would favor organisms that could move, obviously, get out of the sun, okay? Um, shelly organisms, organisms that develop some sort of protective cover to keep the UVB radiation or cosmic radiation out, Organisms that could burrow, dig down into the, into the sediment water interface, get away from the sun, get away. Or simply being able to sense 
day and night. If it's daytime, you can move down. If it's nighttime, you move up. Okay, so these are, these are characteristics that would favor adaptation and survival. All right, so we have a bunch of evidence. When, we, when I first published this paper, we were the only ones who had this idea and we were a little afraid to publish it because we thought we might be a little bit crazy. But after we published it, it turns out people started seeing this everywhere and we're seeing it more and more in our, our uh, estimates of the reversal rate are getting much better through time. Um, where we first looked at this was in the Southern Urals um, and in something called the Zagon Formation, which is upper uh, Ediacaran in age, about 547, we were able to recover from a small uh, volcanic ash layer in here. We were able to discover some of these minerals that carry uranium-235 and 238. And we were then able to measure the parent-daughter ratio and come up with an age of these of 547 million years. So right during the, during the end, near the end of the Ediacaran. Um, and so we have a good age. And from that, we're able to determine the reversal rate. There are some other tools we use to get the full reversal rate, but it was very, very high. Um, this is what those columns look like. This is from our column, the Zagon. The reversal rate is 20 reversals per million years. Um, just underneath these are uh, sediments from the winter coast in Russia with a reversal rate of 10. And if we, um, if we look, I'll show you in just a minute, when we look further on, the Earth's magnetic field begins to recover at about the time that, that life begins to blossom again. So what happens to the Earth's magnetic field? Uh, we now have really good information on that. And if we look at, um, oops, sorry. If we go back and look at the present day, this is the strength of our field today. And you can see this solar standoff distance. Think of that as how far out did the shields go? And so the shields go out about 10 to 11 Earth radii, really good shields. But when we measure the intensity of the magnetic field back in the Ediacaran, it is the lowest intensity ever been measured on Earth. And we have a bunch of measurements. And when we, we tune that to our standoff, it's between two and four Earth radii. So we have lost those shields and they stay down for a long time, and that's important. They don't recover, they just stay weak for a long time. Um, in, in this case, it was for at least 15 to 20 million years. Okay. That is a long time, that is a long time. So again, turning back to this time interval, um, we see uh, 547, this is where the Zagon formation is in here, right in the heyday. Uh, just above the Zagon formation, we stop seeing Ediacaran organisms. In fact, we start seeing them worldwide. But what we notice as well is that we notice that when we look at the fossils, trace fossils, trace fossils are just fossils, not of, they're not body fossils, they're traces of things going about their everyday life, walking, feeding, uh, whatever. They're, we don't actually see the animals. But what we notice is that prior to this extinction, all the trace fossils were horizontal. Everything was moving in those bacterial mats. Nothing was moving beneath them. And then shortly after that, we start seeing vertical burrowing. So organisms burrowing down into the sediment, down through that bacterial mat. We also see hardly any skeletonized organisms before this. And right after that, we start seeing small shelly fossils. Remember, shells can protect you. So this is, you might say, well, that's a little bit of a coincidence. Um, and indeed, that's what we thought. But the more we started thinking about how the magnetic field can affect life and looking at the studies that have been done of, the, of higher UVB radiation, this really makes sense. These are both escape mechanisms, vertical burrowing, small shelly fossils, are escape mechanisms and way for organisms to sense uh, or to protect themselves from UVB radiation. And it's also during this interval where daylight sensing, where blue light sensitivity first evolved in organisms. So it's kind of a triple, triple whammy there. Um, in addition, and I think this is one of the, 
I'm probably a few, one of a few people who believe this, but this is one of the most substantive scientific papers in our field that has ever been written, in my opinion. And uh, David Botcher, who wrote this, um, noted that when you look in the Ediacaran, it's just like I said, in the Ediacaran, all you had was these bacterial mats, the organisms were attached to the mat or living within the mat, but there was no communication with the underwater sediment. It was, everything was here and above. And most of the organisms were sessile. They could not move. And this dominated all of Earth history from the earliest life, the earliest blue-green algae, all the way up until the end of the Ediacaran. If you went back in time, any, any time interval in there, if you went back in time and walked along the seashore, that's what you would walk along, these bacterial slime mats. In the Cambrian, right at the end of the Ediacaran, that all changed. The entire ecosystem, this bacterial mat ecosystem was wiped off the face of the earth. And it was replaced by mobile organisms, organisms that could burrow into the sediment water interface. It oxygenated that upper layer of the ocean sediment and completely changed the face of the earth. And all of this happened. This Cambrian, it's called the Cambrian substrate revolution. But this revolution happened, this, these disappeared at the end of the Ediacaran, and this ecosystem was opened up. So I like to compare this to the time when the dinosaurs went extinct about 66 million years ago. A big asteroid hit the Earth. Dinosaurs had ruled the Earth for hundreds of millions of years. There were little mammals running around trying to stay away from the dinosaurs. But as soon as the dinosaurs were wiped out, the whole ecosystem opened up. And when that ecosystem opened up, it was the mammals who took over the earth. So I like to think of it this way. When this ecosystem was wiped out, the animals, the, the populations that were, had been able to adapt somehow to this incoming solar radiation, whether through mobility, through daylight sensing, through other defense mechanisms, took over the shallow oceans. And that eventually led, about 15 million years later, to the Cambrian uh, radiation, the big, uh, the big blossoming of complex life on Earth that includes all ancestors to modern animals. So these are some pictures. This is, these are these horizontal burrows, trace fossils, probably some sort of worm organism. This is um, from the late Ediacaran. And then this one, Trapicnus pedum, which is an early Cambrian trace fossil, where these worms began burrowing down into the substrate, um, and we no longer see the bacterial mass. Um, we also find something interesting when we look at the end of this, when I, I said it does end eventually, and we see that the reversal frequency kind of ends at about 497 million years, where it goes down to two to three re uh, reversals per million years. That's kind of normal. Um, it, it, but it goes from about 20 down to 8 to 10 and then down to 2 to 3. Well, what happens to oxygen on Earth during that time? Well, it shouldn't surprise, it might surprise you. <laughs> it didn't surprise me to see that as soon as that reversal rate slowed, the shields grew, we were, our planet was able to hold in its atmosphere, oxygen jumps way up. Okay? And that is a direct consequence of an increasing strength of the Earth's magnetic field. All right, so I talked about some of the effects of UV uh, radiation, but the easiest thing to remember is if you're living on a mat ground and you're unable to move, you're unable to burrow deeply, um, you're unlikely to make it through increased uh, UVB radiation. And in fact, it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. So if we lose 40% of our ozone layer, it actually allows a 213% increase in biologically effective radiation causing DNA damage. That means you lose 40% of the ozone layer, you don't end up with 40% more DNA damage, you end up with about five times that amount of DNA damage. So the more ozone you lo the lose, the worse the DNA damage is. Um, we've seen, you've seen a number of responses. These have been studies that have been in modern organisms. Uh, embryonic development, you can see this is a healthy green sea urchin embryo, and this is a uh, 
radiated, UV radiated green sea urchin embryo causing something called emphalosis. So this basically a deformation of the embryo of the embryonic stage. Um, we can see cellular, cellular damage here like skin cancer. Um, these are malformations, different types of malformations in fish larvae that have been exposed to high uh, UV radiation. Um, and the rep reproductive stages in particular are vulnerable. Doesn't mean uh, uh, adults are immune, but the reproductive stages are particularly vulnerable to this. Because we don't really know what Ediacaran organisms are, we, ha we really have a hard time figuring out what their reproductive mechanism was. But there has been some speculation that their reproductive mechanisms involve something called budding and propagules, which just means they're releasing offspring into the shallow seawater. And then those offspring or those embryonic stages are affected by UVB radiation, and they're, and they're very vulnerable to that. Um, on the other hand, things with escape mechanisms, such as being able to burrow beneath the mat ground, you diminish UVB radiation. Shells are, are known to prevent desiccation and UVB damage in the intertidal zones. This is seen in modern intertidal zones. It, it probably it most certainly was true in ancient ones. Uh, vertical migration of metazoans during day and light cycles, um, including the establishment of circadian rhythms uh, or flight from light response. So eye sensing organisms have, have an advantage. And in fact, this vertical migration of uh, plankton uh, became really well known during World War II when we were starting to use sonar to hunt for submarines. And what the, the ship captains noticed, they, they had something called a false bottom, where during the daytime, the sonar would image this layer that was very, very shallow, just kind of below the sunlight, sunlight penetration layer. But it seemed to be like the bottom. And they knew, they knew it was not the bottom of the ocean. Um, but it appeared on sonar to be. And what it was is that during the daylight, these uh, plankton descend out of the UVB radiation and then during the nighttime, they come back up, and that's called DL migration, very common response to organisms to, to increase sunlight. Um, so kind of the punchlines of this story is that um, the reversal rate in the Ediacaran is the highest, more than two and a half times um, so far documented in Earth history. And in fact, kind of almost 10, 10 to 12 times the background rate. The background rate is one to two reversals per million years. Um, those fast reversals we now know are associated with a very, very low energy magnetic field. That low magnetic field results in higher incoming solar and galactic radiation. That high radiation then causes DNA damage, causes organisms which are unable to, or populations of organisms which are unable to adapt to go extinct, and particularly particular um, sessile organisms. It causes the destruction of ozone. It causes lower oxygen in the atmosphere. Um, and then in order to get through that, you have to have an evolutionary adaptation to repair or avoid UVB damage, UVB radiation, which we see those adaptations in the fossil record or organisms when go extinct. When we first, when we first uh, proposed this about I think it was 2016 is when we published the paper. We were really kind of standing out on a limb. And in recent years, like I said, there have been records from the same age rocks showing this very, very high reversal rate. There have been innumerable studies now measuring the ancient intensity of the magnetic field that are, are proving over and over again it's the weakest magnetic field ever recorded. We are now finding out that something was happening on the interior of the planet and this one's a little more, we have a little bit more error in it because it's a calculation based on uh, physics of cooling of a planet. But what we think happened is that the inner core began to become, began to solidify at this time. So prior to this, the inner core was also liquid, much like the outer core. But right around this time, we think the inner core began to nucleate, which may have may be the reason why this magnetic field seems so bizarre at this time. 
Um, there was a study that was out just in October, um, kind of unrelated, a, a group that didn't really know about our work, but they, um, they proposed that the cause of this Ediacaran extinction was um, depleted oxygen in the atmosphere and therefore depleted oxygen in the oceans. And I sent the author <laughs> a note. I said, hey, we mentioned this back in 2016. <laughs> I didn't see that paper. You're right. So I think this story is coming together. Um, it's kind of a neat story about the magnetic field and about an important time in Earth history because this was this this clearing of this eco space that Botcher noticed back in 2000. Um, he didn't really have a mechanism for why that eco space was clear, but I think the story kind of hangs together very, very nicely um, and ties in with the Earth's magnetic field and what we know about the Earth's magnetic field and what we know about the history of life at this time. So I will leave it open for questions. Okay. Yeah, so I'm happy to answer any questions. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, I'm going to attempt the question because I'm not interested in, I'm interested in a slightly different area, but it's the effect of heat on magnetism. And the um, concern I have is, making of steel out of iron. So in essence, a uh, Bessemer furnace, uh, you, you heat up um, the iron and it loses its magnetism and that's when um, they insect um, uh, carbon atoms to make steel. And so I'm, I'm kind of interested in why heat uh, makes the loss of magnetism uh, in this process, uh, and I assume it's generalizable uh, to this process, but I didn't know, and I kind of think of the Earth's mantle being hot, and then you said it got cold. Uh, there's some kind of correlation there, and I'd like for your comments, please. Yeah, so two actually excellent questions. Um, and so to explain the first one, what happens to um, a lot of a lot of times we don't think of things as magnetic, but in fact, everything, every, any all matter is magnetic. It, oh, yeah. All matter is magnetic. Water is magnetic. It's just how different materials respond to an external field that makes the difference. So water, when we apply a magnetic field to water, water actually um, repels the magnetic field. So over at the high mag field lab in Florida State, they've actually taken toads, which are mostly water, put them in a high magnetic field and the toads float, okay? Because the water opposes the magnetic field. For iron, what happens, and it's, it's a, at its very heart, it's a quantum mechanical explanation, but it doesn't have to be that difficult. And it is the fact that the electrons have a spin moment. And as they're heated up, those spin moments tend to align with the adjacent spin moments. And when they do that, because they have a plus and a minus, they tend to form a magnetic field. And in iron, it has to do with the fact that it's metal. Those spin moments align very, very strongly. But what happens when you heat it up is you begin to expand that material and those spin moments begin to move away from one another and they no longer interact. And so they lose their magnetism. And in reality, they, they're still magnetic. They just behave in a different way. They don't couple with one another to form a strong field. So that's something called paramagnetism versus ferromagnetism, which is when it's iron. So what happens during heating is you're just moving those spin moments apart so it so that they don't interact and so that they it doesn't possess its own magnetic field. And then when it cools back down, as it cools back down and those spin moments begin to come closer again, then it will, they will couple with one another and it will, steel is magnetic, as, 
as you will know. So that's what happens there. The second question is, well, what about the inside of the Earth? I thought it was a lot hotter than that. Indeed, it's much hotter than iron when we're making it. But what we have going for us there is that we have it's heat and pressure. So even though the even though the iron in the in the inner core is very very hot, it's solidified, and so those spin moments are are forced to be together. And it's that motion of the outer core that acts like that acts as the generator to generate the Earth's magnetic field. So it seems counterintuitive. Yeah, it's really really hot, but it's heat and pressure that allows it to solidify and allows those spin moments to couple again. Okay. They can't move. Yeah. Well, Will Schaefer. Thank you again for another great talk. Uh, two areas I'd ask uh, you to explore a little bit. When I went over to Antarctica, we found we had a, a conjugate point up north, I think in Newfoundland, for a ham radio to be really transmitted along magnetic waves. Would you talk about the value of the magnetic uh, highways? around the earth and that sort of thing, particularly with regard to communications. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I'll so, save the other one to you. Yeah, that. I mean, yeah, it's um, it, it's of course, because magnetic fields are electrical fields. They're this their electromagnetism is the same force. And so at the south magnetic pole in a present day field, all the magnetic lines are flowing up out of the South Pole and around and back down into the North Pole. So it's kind of like you have almost like you have a wire connected from the South Pole to the magnetic pole. And if the field lines are good, then yes, you can, you can, the radio signal can follow those field lines. If it's relatively undisturbed, follow those field lines and you have a good, good communication to, to places in the Northern hemisphere. The ham, the ham operator had a ball. Yeah. Okay. The other thing is uh, the magnetic field, the influence of earth as a magnet and so on, on uh, climate change, uh, is the, what percentage uh, of the action is involved there? Whew, that one is, gets a little more complicated to answer. Um, the I, I would say, it, I wouldn't even say it's tertiary. I would say the, the magnetic field holds in our atmosphere, so it's important for holding in our atmosphere. But the dynamics of climate change at the rate that they're happening now our magnetic field is really the, the changes in our magnetic field are relatively slow and relatively unimportant to the overall compared to what we're putting into the atmosphere, the amount of CO2 that we're putting into the atmosphere. Basically, it's not it's not doing much of anything. It's not even a tertiary um, cause. You, you talked about the thinning of the atmosphere and so forth. Down at the South Pole, we have a lot of instrumentation with regard to spatial radiation, that sort of thing. Can you talk about how that contributes to this talk? Um, yeah, well, the, the ozone layer is well known from the Southern Hemisphere. Uh, it forms on a yearly basis, sometimes it's worth. In fact, a lot of these studies of, of embryonic uh, and DNA damage are done in, in Antarctica and the Southern Hemisphere when that ozone layer disappears. And there, there are biological effects that happen, but fortunately that ozone layer closes um, it doesn't stay open, uh, and in fact, because we've stopped putting chlorofluorocarbons back into the atmosphere, it's kind of healed itself. But what happens with the magnetic field when we lose the shield? Basically, it, the, the Earth, the energy of those incoming particles just strips. It, it just strips away that ozone layer, and because the, the field is focused at the poles, it strips it away more strongly at the poles than it does at the equator. But even at the equator, the models show you can get up to a 50% decrease in the ozone layer at, at the equator and an 80% decrease at the, at the poles. Uh, Bill Zagel. I was interested in how rapidly these uh, changes occur. If at three o'clock uh, the field decided to switch, would it be done by four or does it take <laughs> yeah, a little very longer? Good yeah, that's a really good question. So our our best estimate, and I think it's pretty good, uh, the field changes to go from a normal field to a full reverse field. It, it's on the order of five to ten thousand years. So if it started to change today, and actually I have a bet, <laughs> I think it is changing now. Uh, I think we're undergoing a reversal, but I had to leave it in my will for my children's 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 children. children's children. 
somebody's going to get a bottle of whiskey or, or I'm going to lose. <laughs> um, it, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't see it. We're not going to see it. Even if it is happening today, we're not going to see it. But what we do see uh, in the last, last 30 years or so, we've seen the magnetic field accelerate from Canada towards Siberia to the point where I mentioned this, uh, runways are oriented according to magnetics. So they're painting runways fairly regularly uh, across the world as the magnetic field shifts and, and they have to change the runway numbers to match the orientation of the magnet, local magnetic field. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, oh yeah, push by. They change the runways to uh, be numer numeric. So the, the runways are all numeric. So you, they'll tell you we're running, we're landing on runway 18 left, for example. Okay. Happen to be a pilot too. So they'll say we're running on landing on 18 left. That means there may be two runways, one on the right, one on the left, and they're facing due south, 180 degrees. They just dropped the zero. Okay. So the runway will run 1836. So 360 will be the if you're coming landing towards the north. And so what happens is those are oriented with the local magnetic declination. And as the field moves, then that number has to change. So they might have to change. Gainesville changed from, I think it was 624 to 725. Uh, Jacksonville changed in 2011. They had to change their runway numbers. Um, yeah. Yeah. With the change in these magnetic fields and the potential for mutations and DNA alterations, is there any correlation has been found with uh, evolution? Yeah, uh, excellent question. This one, I think, this one definitely. Um, what we have seen, there, there's a couple of answers, there, there's, it's a complicated answer. Once a population of organisms adapts to survive an event like this, they usually pass that on to their offspring. So there are a number of organisms that have self-repair mechanisms. Uh, they're called mycosporin, I can't remember the name, MAAs is a nickname. So there are organisms that are able to experience DNA damage and repair. They have cellular repair mechanisms. The second issue is that we have never seen reversal rate like this. Now when the reversal takes place, the most recent one was 780,000 years ago, which is when the Neanderthals went extinct. Um, well, I, the, the major portion of them is what the argument is, were, were extinct. They, they, they obviously, anthropologists will say they actually interbred with modern humans and, and so they didn't truly go extinct, but their population dwindled. So, and I'm not making, I'm just telling you what, what's been reported. So there have been some people that have tried to tie that <laughs> to the reversal of the magnetic field. I don't think that evidence is very strong for that. Um, so a single reversal, a single reversal of the field is too fast. Um, and even though the field is weakened, it's not weakened for long enough to really decimate a large population. What we need is something like happened in the Ediacaran where the field was weak for 15 to 20 million years, never built its way back up. It stayed weak. And that allowed, that allowed populations to be more widely affected by the weakened field. Um, yeah. Obviously, there's a difference between magnetic north and true north. And it varies across widely across the the world uh, but i guess what I'm, uh, I'm really interested about is if we have are moving to some one of these reversals does the normal adjustment to move from magnetic north uh, at a location change uh, uh, the formulation to figure out true north or uh, and what is the variation between, uh, because there's obviously some calculations that have to be done uh, to change from magnetic settings to true. Right. So I will tell you, it is very fortunate for people like me who want to also use this information to put continents where they belong, because 
the Earth's magnetic field is never at geographic north. How can we really know what the relationship is between these old rocks and true north, which is what we're getting at? Turns out that the magnetic field, thankfully, over a period of five to 10,000 years, more or less circles the pole. So the average position, as long as you collect five to 10,000 years worth of sample um, and take an average of that from observatories, from lots of things, we know that averages to the geographic north. So it turns out that that motion, although we can't predict where it might be you know, on a year to year basis, if we expand that over a three to 5,000, 10,000 year time period, the average position of the magnetic pole aligns with the geographic north, which makes sense on a rotating planet. Now the question is, how hard is it to sample three to 5,000 years worth of geologic material? It's incredibly easy. That much sedimentary rock is more than five to 10,000 years. Uh, for igneous rocks, we have to sample multiple lava flows, but it's relatively easy to do that. Around yes, yes. So the, the magnetic field on average. Right. Right. Does the change in sorry? Does the change uh, in magnetic field uh, affect that uh, particular calculation of the axis moving around? No, it doesn't. That most, of the, <laughs> most of the axial motion of the Earth is, is affected by mass imbalances in the interior of the Earth. So if you put something dense in the mantle or if you remove something light from the core mantle boundary, that affects the spin of the planet or really big earthquakes. So I don't know if you ever watched the news, there's a really big earthquake that they'll say that slowed or accelerated the spin by 0.000 one seconds or something like that. But the magnetic field is just, think of it as a passive observer, okay? But because it's, because it's formed by the motion of the outer core, that motion of the outer core, the spin of the Earth helps control that motion. And there may be, there may be small eddies in the outer core, and that's what causes that migration. But overall, on a time average, overall that magnetic field aligns with geographic north or geographic south. It, it does not affect the magnetic field directly. It affects the spin axis quite, it's, we, we know this, we can, we can measure that. And that's because think of it as if you took a basketball and you can spin a basketball on your fingertip and someone puts a ball of clay somewhere midway, that ball of clay will migrate so it spins at the equator. That, that spinning globe wants to keep the mass distributed properly so the heavier masses are going to be along the equatorial plane. And so if we get a mass imbalance, then the spin axis of the Earth will adjust. It's called true polar wander. But it doesn't really affect the magnetic field all that much. Yeah. Um, yes, I wondered if uh, there was a models that might show if there's another phase change happening in the center of the Earth or its vicinity. <sighs> the center of the Earth, uh, the inner core was discovered in 1959 by Inga Lehmann. So we, we have not been studying the inner core for very long. I know that, well, to you, to you and me, it doesn't seem like very long ago. To my students in class, 1959, that was fun. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but we're learning a lot about the inner core and about the makeup of the inner core. We, don't, we know it's mostly iron, nickel, and sulfur, but People are positing that there are other elements in there. And it also turns out from, from really high resolution seismic studies, that it appears that the inner core is spinning just a little bit faster than the planet. So 
we were really, we, there's a lot we don't know about the inner core and there's a lot we don't know about the magnetic field and, and exactly what causes why these reversals happen. We have a really good idea that it has to do with changes in some sort of convection in the outer core, but exactly what those changes need to be and what drives those really still a puzzle to us. It's a, it's a wonderful ongoing area of research, which at least two of us in the, in the department are working on problems like that. Um, so good question. I'm, I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming. I, I also read when the Three Gorges Dam was being built in China, that the weight of the water in that enormous reservoir would affect the spin of the earth. Yes. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. Yes. On a, on a very small level. We, would, we don't notice it, but yes. Yeah. yeah. Where in India did you do your uh, rock sampling? Okay. An uh, easier answer is the only place I've not been in India is uh, probably north of Delhi getting towards the Himalayas because all of that material is very young. So pretty much south of Delhi, east and west, I've been all over the place. So you were working in the Deccan traps? I was there. Area. I was in the, yeah. I have a, brought a sample of the Deccan traps back. I was there December 3rd oh. last year. <laughs> okay, oh, another question. What causes the wobble of the poles? The, so again, the wobble of the poles, it's, it's kind of a regular occurrence. Um, it, it has to do with a couple of things. It has to do with the fact of the interaction of the moon and the earth, their coupled system. So the moon is actually the tidal pull of the moon is slowing the earth down. So you can imagine the earth was spinning faster. So back at 500 million years ago or so, the day was 22 hours. Our top was spinning a little faster, but that tidal interaction of the moon with the earth is actually breaking, slowing the earth. So, so part of that change has to do with the fact that the earth is being slowed down by the moon. Some of the changes in the orbital parameters of the earth have to do with mass imbalances like we were talking about earlier. So it's, it's kind of a combination of different things that are causing that, but it's fairly regular. The oscillations are fairly regular to the point where we can actually use those oscillations because as those oscillations happen, they change the climatic zones a little bit on Earth, you know, as the Earth moves like this and the obliquity changes. So it turns out that we can use those um, and the magnetic properties of materials being deposited. Uh, when you have, uh, let's say you have a more precipitation, you have more erosion, you're delivering more particles to the sedimentary system. And so you end up with a spike in the susceptibility and we can actually measure those spikes, those, those eddies and the susceptibility to figure out what the orbital parameters were millions of years ago. It's kind of fun, kind of fun actually. That's how we determine the rate here actually, was by looking at the susceptibility changes them and tying them to the 405, uh, 100,000 year orbital cyclicity, giving us the timing of that. As fascinating as this is, we've hit, uh, we're over time already. So okay. thank you all very much for the questions mm -hmm. and the level of interest. So let me put in a plug for our four videos that are coming up for the next four Thursday afternoons on which we'll show you as an example of what was going on in Australia, part of Gondwana, uh, as they move through these periods of time and uh, the last one is is really good. It's about it's about the animals in Australia and the megafauna that they experienced too. And the saber, if you can imagine a saber tooth marsupial. <laughs> so, uh, just oh, they they fill the same niches as the animals in the northern hemisphere. So anyway, I hope you'll come. Uh, same time, same place next Thursday. Thank you very much. And just as a as a note, the Ediacaran period, which is what we were talking about today, <laughs> Ediacaran hills are in Australia. Yeah. So, so the Ediacaran period, which we were talking about, that name Ediacaran period comes from the Ediacara Hills in Australia, where the fossils of these organisms are excellently, pre excellently preserved, and it's a type location for the Ediacaran period.
but they're also found in uh, Russia.